is the, um, accessible to all members and it gives you any pertinent information you may want to know about an open meeting. Well, if you would, we're going to ask that you stand with us and join in a moment of silence and as well the Pledge of Allegiance. I'm looking for approval of the consent agenda with item number 13 has been requested that we pull from the agenda. I have a motion for such. So move, Your Honor. Second. Okay, we have a motion with a second to approve the consent agenda that would remove item 13 from that agenda. Again, who will please vote? All council members present voting in the affirmative. Okay, and next is approval of the full agenda as presented you. Are you putting 13 on or? No, know? I am not. Totally, okay. okay. I'll make the motion, Your Honor. Second. second. We have a motion with a second for approval of the full agenda. Please vote. All council members present voting in the affirmative. Okay, first thing on the agenda here is a special pro uh, proclamation for November 1st. 2016 is Extra Mile Day. Whereas the city of Norfolk, Nebraska is a community that acknowledges that a special vibrancy exists within the entire community when individual citizens collectively go an extra mile in personal effort, volunteerism, and service. And whereas the city of Norfolk, Nebraska is a community that encourages citizens to maximize their personal contribution to the community by giving of themselves wholeheartedly and with total effort, commitment, and conviction to their individual ambitions, family, friends, and community. And whereas the city of Norfolk, Nebraska is a community that chooses to shine a light on and to celebrate individuals and organizations within the community who do go the extra mile in order to make a difference and lift up fellow members of their community. And whereas the city of Norfolk, Nebraska acknowledges the mission of the Extra Mile America Foundation to create 200 extra mile cities and states in America and it's proud to support Extra Mile Day on November 1st, 2016. Now therefore be it resolved that I, Sue Fookman, Mayor of the City of Norfolk, Nebraska, do hereby proclaim November 1st, 2016 as Extra Mile Day in the City of Norfolk, Nebraska and I urge each individual in our community to take time on this day to go that extra mile in his or her, no, her own life and to also acknowledge all those around who are inspirational in their efforts and in their commitments to make their organization, their families and community, country, or whole world a better place. Okay. And then before we jump into the public hearings, I've been asked to take item 30 from the irregular agenda and move that forward. Um, we have a couple gentlemen that we we'll have here to give some explanation on this item that's kind of been ongoing for some time and we need them to be at another meeting in a short time. So consideration of approval of an addendum and extension agreement with the Sanitary and Improvement District Number 1 of Stanton County in which the city agreed to receive sewer effluent from SID 1 after June 1st of 2016. If I can have a motion for consideration. I'll make the motion, Your Honor. Second. All right, we have a motion with a second. Gentlemen, you're on. All right, uh, Marion City Council, um, we're just gonna give you a real quick update. We got a couple pictures to show you. Um, this here is of the detention basin, um, pretty much complete. Um, uh, you can see the inlet pipe there to the uh, to this side, then there's one a little further that way. But anyway, so the, the basin is basically complete. Um, Dennis, the next picture? Yeah. 
And this is the new flow station that houses the new uh, flow meter. Dennis and I were out there today and we started that system up and uh, calibrated it and set it up. And uh, basically we're almost to the point. And this is how, this is the partial flume that we refer to of how we measure the flow. So the flow goes through there. It's currently flowing through there, through the old system and the new system and we're, we're making sure that both uh, meters are pretty close in readings before we shut off the old system and then they'll move on and then I'll let you explain uh, the piping that's coming forth after this week. Yeah, so um, they haven't really done a whole lot on the piping going from the existing partial flume to this one. Um, at tonight's SID meeting there will be a, <coughs> a change order for there's going to be some, the six inch pipe will be coming out of the existing partial flume. That's going to be set at a certain slope so that we can receive only approximately either 312 or 345 gallon per minute if the trailer park is added on. Um, uh, there's, so they had planned on some new six inch pipe as kind of the controlling factor for our flows from them. However, they want to put new 12 inch pipe too from the existing partial flume to the new partial flume there will be six inch pipe about 200 feet and then they'll put some new 12 inch pipe that was not in the original bid and so that's going to go for a change order tonight for uh, uh for rutchins construction um, so if that gets approved at their board meeting tonight um, <coughs> rutchins will get that pipe ordered tomorrow um, probably monday is when they'll start laying that pipe should take three to four days so by next thursday friday at the next very week Thursday or Friday, we should be flowing, you know, if we get a rain event, it, it would flow into the basin. We're waiting for them to get a valve that will be automatically act electrically actuated, and that will be here mid-November. So, but we can manually run the system after next week is what, what the plans are. So in the event of a rain event, we are able to handle the, you know, their, their sewage F, F, you know, the overflow would go into that basin. Then, as Todd said, we just manually open a valve to drain it back into our system. So, anyway, by hopefully by this time next, uh, you know, another week, we'll be pretty much done, other than the automatic valve. Are our citizens down there that certainly were hoping this day would come, are they well aware of what's going on? They were aware. I talked to them um, probably four to five weeks ago and told them that what was occurring, and I will visit with them. Um, probably late, mid, mid to late next week to let them know that basically the project is nearing completion. Very good. And if, if we have that large vent and there's an, an electrical storm knocks out power to that particular uh, automated valve, what's the backup for that? Well, and it won't, it, it won't matter basically because at least during the storm, during the rain event, it'll still, because it's a kind of a non-adjustable, it's not electrically, anything electrical with it, the excess will flow into that basin uh, but if we would lose power, then the automatic valve would not open to allow back into our system from the from the basin. Very good, thank you. So again, electricity, you know, if we goes out or something, that should not affect it at all. We're covered. Great okay. job, gentlemen. It's you worked hard and long, and um, on behalf of this community, but as well, I think SID two has appreciated every moment that you've spent out there with them. So. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that, Mayor. Thank but again, you. everybody's put a lot of time in. A lot, a lot of teamwork. Of, yeah, teamwork with everybody because <laughs> yeah. it's been kind of a long time coming. I think they would say the same thing. So. Any other questions at all for him? Okay. Carry right. forth. Thanks for coming forward. <clears throat> all right. Then let's move back up to. Yeah. I'm sorry. Would you like to vote on that? I would, yeah. <laughs> Please do. All council members present voting in the affirmative. Motion carries. All right. Now, can we go back up to the public hearings? All right. First, we're going to consider a uh, public hearing is going to be open to consider a blighted and a substandard declaration for the area referred to as the West Highway 275 redevelopment area, generally located southwest of West Highway 275. I'm going to open this hearing and <coughs> who's looking to start the discussion? Shane? I will, Your Honor. Uh, Mayor and Council. Mayor and Council, uh, this area has been identified as an area, oh, going on a year ago for some redevelopment of our, of our community. Um, the lion's share of the area lies outside of our city limits, but it's on our southwest corridor. 
Um, and we looked at this area for redevelopment uh, to get rid of some blight uh, and some, some standard issues in the area. Um, we engaged with the district, Northeast Economic Development District, and their staff is here as well today to really take a look at this to see if it meets the statutory requirements for blight and substandard. Uh, we believe it does, and I'll let the staff kind of go through their findings here today for you, and then we'd uh, sure open the floor to any questions that uh, you or the public would have in reference to this study. So, Jan, if you could take it from there, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Shane. Um, the you result... Know, she I'm sorry. Oh, she did yeah, okay. I have. Yeah. <laughs> I figured I'd get poked from this. <laughs> no, I had a yeah there. Great. So on the West um, 275 Redevelopment District, it has me met the substandard and blighted um, criteria. On the substandard, it has met two of the criteria, and that is the de dilapidation and uh, deterioration. Um, out there, out of the 24 structures, 30 or 20, uh, out of the 30 structures, 24 of them have met the rating of poor or fair or dilapidated. And of the age, the average age of the structures out there are 47.16 years. So 17 of those structures are more than 56% um, or 56% 56, 56 of the buildings are more than 40 years old. <coughs> then on the blighted, it has met six of the criterias. Um, obviously, again, they have the, um, the 30 of the 30 structures. 24 of them are rated poor or fair um, or dilapidated. Um, there's also the existence uh, of inadequate street layout. Um, of the 553 acres, 29 tracks lacks um, transportation uh, infrastructure. Then there's also unsafe and unsanitary conditions out there. Um, there's an open cellar um, that has been frequent by some, um, we're assuming younger uh, adolescents, and um, there's been some signs of things that they've left out there, and it becomes pretty sure that it's unsafe for them to be uh, using that facility. There's also some collapsed structures out there, and um, there is, um, let's see, um, that, then there's also the lack of infrastructure for the streets, the sidewalks, sewers, water, and telecommunication, which that prevents development out there. So we've determined that it's been blighted and substandard. We have sent out letters to the property owners in the study area. Our office did receive one phone call from one property owner requesting additional information, and we gave them that information, and then that was resolved. Okay, very good, Jen. Any I'll just point out, uh, Your Honor and the Council, you know, when you look at this semi-triangular piece, what we're trying to do is tie together the blight in the area. It's really at all three points of the triangle. From the northern portion here, um, tying together this blight, which is pretty apparent to uh, blight that's down on here on the on, on this corner of the, of the parcel, and then light way on the shoe or the toe of this parcel as well. So there's light. <clears throat> We're tying all that light together and getting a whole area for redevelopment of our community, uh, of our southwest portion of our community. And this would bring us to what percentage of our total? Um, right at 32 percent, 31 percent. We believe we there is some old redevelopment uh, that we that we're going to be coming to the council to have removed um, out of the light substandard that we've done years ago in our community. Um, so we haven't finalized that to bring it forward to the elected officials, but we're in the process of doing that. So our max is 35% for first class city. We can go up to 35% of the total um, square, square acres of the community or the total city limits of the community. And we're obviously under that yet. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank, thank you. you. You're free, Jan. 
as this is a public hearing, is there anyone else that wishes to come forward and speak to this or may have questions regarding this? We would ask you to come forward, state your name, and sign in for us if so. Okay, seeing none, I'm going to go ahead and close this hearing and ask for consideration of resolution number 2016-52 declaring the area generally located southwest of Highway 275 referred to as West Highway 275 development area as blighted and substandard. Your Honor, I would offer for consideration resolution number 2016-52. Second. Okay, we have a motion with a second. Any further discussion at all, Council? If not, I would ask that you vote. All Council members present voting in the affirmative. Resolution 2016 is adopted. All right. Thanks, girls. Next on the agenda is consideration of ordinance number 5430, which would be amending the city's comprehensive plan from single family residential to mixed use on the property addressed as 3204 West Benjamin Avenue. Ordinance number 5430 was tabled at the September 19th, 2016 City Council meeting and pulled from the October 3rd City Council agenda at the request of the applicant. So first I am looking for a motion to put back on the table ordinance number 5430. I'll make the motion, Your Honor. Second. We have a motion with a second to bring back ordinance number 5430. All in favor, please vote. All council members present voting in the affirmative. All right. And with that now would be do I ask once again for consideration? Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm looking for consideration of Ordinance 5430, amending the comprehensive plan of the state. Your Honor, I'd move consideration of Ordinance 5430. Second. All right, we have a motion with a second for consideration of discussion here. Mayor and Council, I just wanted to let you know, um, I know the question came up during the public hearing, if there were any pictures of what was proposed there. The applicants do have a PowerPoint show to show you if you would like to see that. Elected officials? Okay. I would. Please. Come forward, sir, and if you will, state your name and sign in for us. My name is Tim Brogan, and I am not the applicant, but I am the proposed, or one of the two proposed buyers of this property. And so I was designated the person to come up and speak. But we're buying the property, or I have a contract to buy this property, and this property is located on West Benjamin Avenue. We're buying it from OB1 LLC, which is Jay and Tanya Kenobi is who it is. And basically what it is is uh, the property is you get an overhead view. This lot is approximately 1.8 acres. It is located west of the fire station or the satellite fire station. And across the street to the south of this property is the open lot and in addition to that, the El Dorado Clubhouse. And what's nice about living in Norfolk is you get to hear a lot of great things. And one of the things in the community is, is that we were going to put a gas station there, and that's the reason for the change, and then a convenience store, and then a four-story building. And then I think the most recent one I heard was that we're at our office building in there and put a six-story building above that. So 
Uh, we're not. <laughs> if you will, if you could go ahead and click and show, basically, uh, this is an opportunity for the other buyer who is Chuck Olson. Uh, Chuck Olson and I are the two proposed buyers subject to these hearings this evening. And basically the purpose of what we want to do as we go through these is put in a one-story professional office building. And although we've heard a lot of great rumors, as I said, probably what we want to do is, uh, I'm a lifelong member of the community. I was sentenced here to life. <laughs> And so I want to basically, and so does Chuck, who's been in his business of 20 years to invest back in our community. And in addition to that, we want to invest in an area that not too long ago, uh, the golf course or the El Dorado area was potentially going to go down. And we think it's a great area, and it's basically our stamp of approval uh, of what we think has gone on there and is going to continue to go on there. And lastly, Chuck and his business, the Calm Water Financial Guys and myself, uh, potentially as the law firm of Brogan Gray, want to invest in ourselves. And we want to invest in this community, in that area, and in ourselves. And it's a corridor there that we had looked at property uh, west of Midwest Bank, but believe it or not, uh, it was sold uh, out from us, in essence. And so, you know, if you don't believe that that corridor, you know, with El Dorado, with the fire station and Midwest Bank and that lots west of that, if you don't think that corridor is going to develop into a business district, uh, I think we're fooling ourselves. And I'm not saying that for any other reason than if you go on West Dodge in Omaha and you get off on one of those uh, western streets and run north-south, you're going to see exactly what probably Benjamin Avenue is going to look like. Um, Benjamin, Benjamin Avenue is not going to have big homes built up right up to those areas on Benjamin Avenue, but I think you're going to start seeing uh, more of the multifamily and things of that nature. Personally, not as a proposed applicant or buyer of this property, I am one of the homeowners. So when the notice went out on this, I received the notice because I'm within personally 300 feet. And I can tell you my desire is in no way, shape, or form to upset my neighbors. I've got to live there. And I do not want to upset myself because I have property that's invested there that I don't want to go down in value. My greatest concern for that lot is it's probably not going to stay as that older, beautiful home that it was at one time, which I know a lot of people have a lot of stories about. But it's probably not going to stay in that fashion anymore. And my greatest concern would be a multifamily usage of apartment complexes. Uh, I don't think that would fit in there. I think that is what people have expressed is a lot more traffic. And I think a lot more traffic there is going to be 24 hours, seven days a week traffic when it's residential. If you have a professional office building, uh, we're going to be open, some would say not enough. Uh, I appreciate that. But I would tell you this is, is that uh, for us in our businesses, uh, which is a strange investment for us, is that uh, the practice of law and things like that has become a virtual reality. Uh, we do most of ours uh, with uh, our clients in the Northeast Community College, Faith Regional, and places like that. Uh, we don't have a lot of meetings in our place, so the traffic count is, uh, we do most everything by telephone and or on email. Uh, the, the old form of law firm uh, doesn't exist. Um, but nonetheless, there will be some traffic, but that's a high traffic area nonetheless. Uh, but my greater concern as a person and as a neighbor is, is uh, the 24-7 multifamily type of homes. So I guess I would open it up to any questions you might have. Uh, he's been going through these pictures. Uh, we wanted to uh, let you know that we want to keep the setting of trees. Um, I would tell you this much, that 1.8 acres has a lot of trees around it. And it's our desire to keep all the border trees and or add to the landscaping to the area and keep it a tranquil area. Um, I appreciate the neighbors may or may not want to see us, while our clients probably don't want to look into their world either. If you look to the north of this property, if you were to do a panoramic, to the north is number nine green, to the west is going to be number five green, and across the street and to the southwest is number four green. So in three directions is greens, and so we, we really think it's a beautiful area. and. Uh, I guess I'll stop there right now and entertain any questions anybody's going to have. Okay. Council? What, what would the hours of operation be? Was it nine to, 8 to 5, 9 to 5, or if, if you're an attorney, it's at 10 to 2? It's <laughs> officially, our office is open from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., but I don't always catch the 8 a.m. so good. 
But I would tell you, yeah, the one thing if I was a neighbor to be concerned about, I appreciate they don't want lawyers moving in, I get that, but we have to go somewhere. So typ typical hours, business hours. Correct. Okay. Thank you. How about the Quonset that's down and below? Yeah, um, there's a house that sits just off of Benjamin Avenue, and that's where this is situated. So we're kind of where the house is, where it's going to start. There'd be customer parking uh, up top there. That drive down below to the backside to the Quonset or the Morton building, the Morton building would be removed because of parking requirements. We would have the staff and uh, all others park down low and have just enough on the street side just to allow people to park there or customers. Okay, thank but you. the building would go. You bet. Thank you. So to most trees currently there will remain and some may be added? A lot more will be probably added. I would tell you all border trees will stay because it won't be affected by the construction. Uh, internally there will have to be more fill brought into that area. Uh, so the internal trees might disappear some, but it's our desire and it can keep all the border trees. If you can see to the west or to the left, there's a lot of trees that's on El Dorado's property, so we couldn't touch that anyway. But there is a row of trees right behind the house that will have to be taken out, but not on the border. Okay. Anything else? Any council? Okay. Thank you for your time. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. If no further discussion, then I'm assuming, Beth, we have a short title. Um, anyone else that wants to come forward and speak to this before I, since we've had Mr. Brogan here? Okay. Jay? You're good? Okay. Planning Commission report. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Uh, planning Commission report. The Norfolk Planning Commission held a public hearing on September 7, 2016 to consider amending the City of Norfolk's comp plan from single family residential to mixed use on the property located at 3204 West Benjamin. OB1 LLC applied for a rezone on the property which requires amendment to the comp plan. The planning commission recommends approval on a seven to zero vote. All right, then we're ready for that vote. Voting in favor of the ordinance, council members Lange, Merrill, Clausen, Murin, Moaning, Faust, File, Voting Against the Ordinance, Councilman Granquist, Ordinance 5430 carries on first reading. Okay. Ready? Your Honor, um, since this is a comp plan change and, and not a zoning change um, so that we can physically move forward with the, the zoning thing, I would move that we suspend the rules and uh, adopt this or hear this on second and third reading. Second there. All right, we have a motion with a second to suspend the rules and pass ordinance 5430 amending the city's comprehensive plan. If no further discussion, please vote. Voting in favor of suspending the rules on second and third reading. Council members Lange, Merrill, Clausen, Murin, Moaning, Faust, File, voting against the motion. Council member Granquist, motion carries. Ordinance 5430 carries on second and third reading. All right, and then next would be consideration of ordinance number 5431, approving the zoning change from A, Agricultural District to OB, <coughs> Office District, on property addressed at 3204 West Benjamin Avenue. Again, Ordinance 5431 was tabled at the September 19th Council meeting and pulled from the October 3rd. So again, we will need to ask for a motion to pull or put back on the table Ordinance number 5431. So moved, Your Honor. Second. Motion with a second. Please vote. All council members present voting in the affirmative. All right, and then moving forward with 5431, and certainly we heard from Mr. Brogan here on this. We need a motion, yep, yep, to pull back ordinance 5431. Do I have consideration now? Your Honor, I move consideration of ordinance number 5431. Second. All right, we have a motion with a second. 
Again. Any further discussion up here or from within on this, the actual zoning change? And more of a clarification, and I'd like to address it to Val. Val, what does Office of District allow us, what can be put in there under the current zoning condition? Generally, Office District permitted uses are corporate, general, medical offices, other similar uses. It does allow multifamily dwellings as a permitted use and um, really just general offices for the most part. Do we have any kind of an overlay thing say, stating that this is exactly what they're going to put in? Or can they change their mind and do different things? You're talking like a conditional use permit? Well, that or just make an overlay saying this is, we are going to do this. And if it gets changed to OD, then any of those permitted uses in OD can go in there. So if they decide to change their mind and something else goes in, if it's a permitted use in that zoning category, it's allowed to go in without coming back before Planning Commission or City Council. And to go along with that, that's at any point in time also. So like 20 years from now when the owners are retired and living in in uh, Phoenix or wherever, you can leave or not. So somebody right. else could potentially buy it and do the the biggest concern that that has been uh, voiced a little bit is uh, potential for multifamily housing to go in there. Um, uh, you know, with with 1.8 acres. Um, uh, I guess the, the, the stretch on that is that, yeah, um, there would have to, you know, with the amount of investment that's going into this under the, underneath the current zoning situation, it would be a relatively expensive and I would anticipate a low return situation as far as, you know, being where, a, where, a, where an owner would decide to build on that that way, so. Yes, as it currently stands in our code, if we do not change the code in the next 20 years and somebody wants to tear down the office building and put up multifamily, they could potentially do that unless we change the code to either take out the multifamily or make it a conditional use. And then someone would be able to come in and ask for multifamily and then you all would have the chance to say yes or no, that's an appropriate place for that. And also, uh, just I would tell the council, um, last week we had a subcommittee meeting that discussed the very thing that Val is talking about, about the potential of looking at the code and possibly amending it. It was high level. We didn't get into the details at that meeting, but uh, intend to continue to ask that question uh, amongst the elected officials and planning commission members. We had a joint subcommittee meeting with planning commission members and, and council present. And we talked about that very thing. Is it something where we would want to consider putting a, perhaps a conditional use permit in an OD to allow for the multifamily, but only with a conditional use permit? And that seemed to be get some favorable favorable traction from the folks that were in that subcommittee. So that's something we're going to continue to explore. So that potentially would be a code change that you'd be looking at in in the near future. Well, and that's kind of what I was getting at. I was at that meet again, you know, um, with, without that having been discussed and without that potential hanging out there, I, I would be considerably more leery of it because of concerns that have been voiced by the neighbors. But um, again, uh, with the um, direction as presented by the, um, the, uh, the future owners of it or very near future owners of it, I guess um, you got to go a little bit on faith that we're going to be able to protect the interests of everybody involved here. So, And Val, if, if I can look at you to say, too, it was certainly something that you had suggested <coughs> as far as the conditional use. You yes. supported it. Is that fair? Yes, I would say I would support the conditional use as multifamily in an OD district because it really is meant to be an office district with maybe a little bit of 
residential. <coughs> it's kind of that buffer area a little bit between commercial and residential. Okay. And also there's, well, I, would it be true that, I mean, some unique parts of the town, perhaps you, the OD and the multifamily would go together um, in different areas of the town. So that would open up the opportunity at least for a developer to ask the question under the condition to use permit scenario and having the planning commission at that point then put some sort of uh, conditions on it, w whether that be the number of units or the height or those kind of things, is that correct? Yeah, that's just a way to look at that buffer area and kind of have a little bit more control over that, like you said, based on where it is in town, it may be more appropriate in other areas mm -hmm. than some, and that's a way then we can put some conditions on it so that it fits into the, the neighborhood and office district or wherever it's going to be then. This is just piqued my interest in the general topic. How many different conditional use permit allowances are there uh, within office development? Because you may, you may remember, I, I haven't forgotten about it, we, we did allow for a car lot to be a conditional use permit under uh, office de development district not too long ago. So it seems pretty open-ended to me. It's a little hard to give you a definite answer as to how many conditional uses and what conditional uses are allowed in OD because that gets into the um, section 27-401, the land use matrix, and that's about 25 pages or so. Um, just generally speaking, under the conditional uses, under the office district intent, um, is lawn care services and mortuaries and funeral home services, but obviously that doesn't entail, you know, all 25 pages of the land use matrix. So that's when you have to go into there and look at the specific use. I'd like to reiterate some of the things that Jim said. I've had some neighbors call and they're worried about the, the other uses. I'm taking these guys' word for it that they're going to do that too, or we might have to have a lawsuit or something going on, but we'd probably lose that with them. So, <laughs> But I do want to reiterate that we're taking their word for it. I'm voting that they're going to do what they say they do. I am leery of the other things that can go in there, and I wish we would do some kind of changing so we don't have, be put in this situation where they either have to do an overlay or a, a use permit to prove what they're going to do so the neighbors all know. That's the only thing I'm concerned of, but but I am supportive if they do what they say they're going to do right now. So. And I think the neighbors understand that too, and certainly have faith in what's been brought before. But just as has been expressed, and as um, Councilman said, you know what it is in five years and 15 years, and I'll give Tim another 25 years, whatever it might be. Then who and what? So again, it goes back to, but certainly Val gave us some explanation of areas of our community that are maybe currently um, residential where the request to go in with office district has been requested. And certainly there are some larger homes in this community that have been transferred into uh, an office area for, so it all, you know, you never, you're never completely out of the woods with some of the different requests that come before. But I do think the discussion for a conditional use permit for anything residential could certainly be um, more discussion by the elected body. So I think it will continue. It's just something that needs to have a lot of discussion. And I don't think, you know, we're going to, they're going to be going anywhere before we get that tackled. That's just. Right, Josh? <laughs> I better be careful here. But with all that being said, anyone else that has any discussion or questions they might want to bring forward? Mayor, I'd like to state, um, obviously I voted no before and, and not looking in favor of it this time either, but the picture doesn't necessarily show a general idea of what's going on. I, and, and I can respect the talk of what's, what's near where this proposal is going to be, but there is residential to the west. Um, there is residential to the south. The only where only place there isn't residential is straight north because it's um, because there's a T. Well, actually, I think there's a green or a hole right there. So um, I still see this as residential. I think it should stay residential. Personally, we wouldn't have this conversation or have these um, thoughts or issues even come up if we left it. At, well, it's ag right now, but if we put it as residential rather than 
I'm going this way. I can totally respect, and I'm sure they're going to do exactly what they're saying. It's a beautiful outlay of what they're saying. So if it does go through, I, I don't doubt that at all. But um, my thought is it's going right in the middle of residential, and this is spot zoning at its finest. I respect that. Anyone else with comments? Okay. Then I, we're going to move forward with, um, what do we need? Beth, the uh, planning commission. Planning, okay. Planning no, first planning commission held a public hearing on September 7th to, at the request for OBI 1 LLC to consider a zone chain from A to OD on property at 3204 West Benjamin. The planning commission recommends approval of the request on a six to one vote. Okay. And so are we ready for vote or do we need the short, short title, title on this then. too? Okay. An ordinance of the city of Norfolk, Nebraska to amending the zoning district map of the city of Norfolk, providing this ordinance shall be in full force and effect and providing for publication of this ordinance in pamphlet form. And with that, please vote. Voting in favor of ordinance 5431, council members Lange, Merrill, Clausen, Murin, Moaning, Faust, File. Voting against the motion, council member Granquist. Ordinance 5431 carries on first reading. Okay, we'll move forward then. And let's see, um, that means we'll be hearing this on second reading in November two weeks. November 7th. November 7th. Okay, so with that, we're going to move down then to the regular agenda, item 31. Consideration of approval of a local amendment to project agreement to project agreement between the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission and the City of North Fork Riverfront Trail Project. If I could have a motion for consideration of approval, I'll make a motion, Your Honor. Second. All right. We have a motion with a second. Discussion. Who's speaking to this, Dennis? Dennis will speak to this. Thank you. Uh, this is an extension of our grant application with the uh, Nebraska Game and Parks Commission <laughs> from completion date of August 18th, 2016 to uh, projected uh, date of August 1st of 2017. Um, we're making good proje progress on the project uh, up and through the NEPA document submittals. We were about 30 days behind schedule at that point in time. Um, We've gotten farther behind as we've gotten into the right-of-way uh, phase of the project. Um, probably three reasons for this. One was that the consulting engineer underestimated the time required to do right-of-way acquisition according to the uh, Federal Highway Administration rules and procedures. Uh, unfortunately, the consulting firm on one track uh, left out uh, portions of the property that was needed when they uh, transferred from the construction drawings to the right-of-way easement and drawings and documents. And then we've got one uh, property owner that has expressed some concerns about uh, the location of the property line between them and the railroad right-of-way, liability for accidents on the trail, uh, and then the <coughs> amount of compensation. Unfortunately, it's the same property owner that we had the issues with the, the drawings on. Currently, we have the appraisals and reappraisals that uh, completed that were required uh, on item two. Those have been uh, the comparables uh, available. There's two new comparables that are, were available that lived in a higher value of this property that was closer to the uh, counter offer we received from the property owner. This higher offer has been communicated to the property owner. We believe that the uh, recreational liability uh, Act will protect the property owner from any uh, liability related to the trail on their property. Um, currently, the property owner has communicated to the negotiator that they want to have a surveyor survey the line between their property and the railroad uh, right of way. Uh, we've got the negotiator trying to encourage them to uh, get that uh, surveyor on board and get that uh, taken care of uh, as quickly as we as possible. With that, I would answer any questions and would recommend approval. Hey, 
Dennis, is it fair to say that the acquisitions and agreements with the other property owners uh, in this area were done comparatively um, fairly smoothly and efficiently? Yes, we've had no issues with any of the other property owners. I think that the last of those agreements were on the consent agenda tonight. Um, we've uh, met with all the property owners. The delays were it just takes uh, quite a while to get the appraisals completed and then you have a re review appraisal process and, and then you've got your negotiations. And um, they were estimating about three or four weeks for those to occur and other than the one that we're still dealing with, uh, it took about two months, which doesn't seem unreasonable. You know, things were moving along and, uh, you know, one of them was the Knights of Columbus and, you know, just some of their meeting things and, uh, you know, it takes time to get those dates to come We're, we're essentially waiting on one property. We have one property owner left to, yeah. to deal with. The other, the other ones are all complete yeah. or will be. Okay. So Thanks. they're hiring a surveyor, is that what you said? Yes, they want to hire a surveyor to establish that line between the railroad and their property line. Their contention is, is that when the railroad moved within their right-of-way, that that may have changed the right-of-way line. Were we able to put any kind of a time frame on them to say it needs to be? Um, Maybe not, huh? You have to be careful in, in you have to negotiate in good faith to comply with the federal rules and regulations you know they're saying you know 30 to 60 days for these folks to to do that uh, okay. um, they can drag their feet some you, at some point if they continue to drag their feet I think we can probably move forward but uh, the last thing you want to do is is, is uh, move too quickly you know, we had a saying around years ago sometimes you have to go slow to go fast Appreciate that. Currently, this property is vacant and idle, correct? Yes, there's uh, there's one one building, one occupied building on the site. No. I said no, un no, unoccupied. No, no, no. I thought I said I thought, unoccupied. Yeah, I said occupied, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure it's occupiable. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions, discussion? <clears throat> if not, are we ready to vote? Please do. All council members voting in the affirmative motion carries. All right. Next, we're looking for consideration of approval to award a contract to Dixon Construction of Correctionville, Iowa, for the Norfolk Avenue Paving and Bridge Improvement Section A Roadway Improvements, Section B Ductile Iron Water Main, and Section C Concrete Girder Bridge, in the amount of. Four million seven hundred forty-three thousand six hundred twelve dollars and seventy cents. It's so moved, Your Honor. Second. All right. We have a motion with a second. <coughs> this is our East Norfolk Avenue Bridge project. The bridge down there. This is a project that's been under design for uh, a while now. We're working with Olson and Olson's uh, engineering on this project, and it's very unique. I would say in the fact that. Uh, it's in our downtown and part of the project and part of the desires of the project are really tying together the beautification efforts that have been going on downtown basically extending the streetscape from downtown uh, across the east to this bridge and then putting in a new bridge that's going to last us for we hope 100 100 years or so the bridge where we're currently taken out is 80 80 85 years old roughly um, so it's it served us well as a community but uh, this is a growing part of our town a growing traffic trafficable part of our town and obviously have a lot of great commercial businesses in and around this area um, so I just wanted to kind of introduce that because I think the council knows about it and the community knows that this is a project that's uh, been under under um, design for a while not only the streetscape portion is going to be pertinent to this project but we have some boards over here that show that but the trail um, the trail is going to run from uh, the trail that jo that Dennis was just talking about coming from Johnson Park basically down to the south and underneath this bridge and then uh, continuing down south just a bit and wrapping around and to bring com to bring foot traffic down to this uh, to our uh, business district in the downtown um, and the beautification of the area along with some retaining walls and that trail system and some landscaping that you'll see on this schematic here, and we have others that we could get to if you're if if you're interested, um, is really going to 
really bring a focal point. Um, you know, bridges in communities are focal points, and uh, especially in high traffic areas. Um, and this is one of those things. So um, pretty excited about the look of this bridge and the design of this bridge, and then the bringing of bringing of all those components together to beautify our area down there. But it's, it's expensive, four point seven million dollars. So um, be happy to answer any questions that the mayor and council might have. But uh, that's that's where we're at, and we'd like to get started. Uh, I, I, I must point out that. Uh, um, part of the project was the desire from the businesses down there to keep it as short as possible because this is going to be a one construction season project. So the bridge is going to be demoed and rebuilt within a construction season. Uh, we did incentivize it on the front end of that if they get done sooner that there's some incentives for that. And that's really a driver for the economics of, of our community because there are major businesses that, down in this area, Hy-Vee and, and other restaurants and a car dealership and many, many other businesses that you see here we have that are on, that are gonna remain open, you know, on the east side of this bridge and uh, they're gonna hold their breath and, and uh, let this bridge project go fast and that's our intent is to get it done in a quick manner and uh, get that traffic flowing because this is a well-trafficked area down there. <clears throat> so please continue to remember our businesses down on, the, on our eastern border there on the east side of this bridge and in our central core because traffic will be discombobulated, I think that's a word, kind of, um, down in that area for that construction season. So we want to uh, make sure that our community makes, makes uh, frequent businesses to our business partners in the area down there. Shane, could you tell the public a couple of the next bids? Because we're almost at $5 million, just so they know. Yeah, Dennis, go ahead. Um, we received two bids on this project. Uh, the low bidder was submitted by Dixon Construction at about $4.7 million. The other bidder was a and Construction at about $4.9 million, just a little bit shy than, of $5 million. Both these bids were over our engineer's estimate, unfortunately. Uh, we feel they're very competitive with each other. You know, you're about 5% difference on $5 million. Uh, that's probably getting fairly tight in the, the bids. Um, some of the reasons that the project's more expensive than anticipated is, you know, the restricted area that we have for, for doing the paving in the bridge construction in the urban environment, um, tight time frames with uh, heavy liquidated damages. There was some concrete material costs increases and then some of the bridge aesthetics uh, we wanted to, to have there that uh, probably caused our estimate to be a little bit over the engineer's estimate. I think, Dennis, the one thing that I heard you say was um, you were rather surprised that maybe only two bids, but it was in four. It was mentioned to you. I'd ask you to share. Uh, it's just primarily uh, there's a lot of work around for these uh, paving contractors and bridge contractors. Uh, we had uh, three bridge folks uh, pretty uh, interested at a pre-bid meeting. Only one of them or two of them ended up bidding the third one looked at it and says even though we're six months ahead of the start date it wasn't going to work into his schedule with some of the other work he had and um, the other thing is is you know it's going to take a, a lot of resources from one bridge contractor for an entire construction season to get this this big bridge done so um, you know it's tough to it's tough to get the Hawkins and the Kiwits and those types of people that have lots and lots of bridge crews to, to come to projects like this. Um, they're looking for projects where they've got multiple bridges uh, interchanged yeah. down in, yeah. in the Omaha area where they did lots <clears throat> of them. So um, with the overrun in the project uh, budget wise, there's a couple of street projects that are going to have to get delayed to the 2018 season. But uh, I think this is a project that we need to, to move forward. It'll be a huge improvement for the for the for the community one of the things that i'm encouraged by is is that the contractor has a schedule his preliminary schedule is showing that uh, he plans to be done about 30 days ahead of schedule which would be great that if he uh, can actually make that happen but uh, um, it's better than have a schedule that i'm going to meet at the completion date because invariably there are something will happen that uh, will adversely affect a, a schedule the greatest thing for the city would be is that he can find ways to get it done another 30 days early so so uh, projected start date in april or did we 
No. Actually, the start date will probably be sometime uh, early March. <clears throat> um, they've got nine months to do it, and they have to be done by the 15th of November. Um, so uh, I don't want to take the chances on the on the early early winter and in, in those types of things. Uh, you know, bridge demo can be done in, in some uh, uh, nastier weather. They have to relocate a water line before they can start driving pile. Uh, that's something that can be done uh, uh, in uh, less than ideal conditions. Uh, it'll be uh, directionally bored, so most of it'll be guys sitting up on one side of the bridge and boring a hole to the other side, so we'll have a couple small connection points. So it'll be better for them to start earlier in the season, and if they get to, you, know, you can take a bridge down in the in the rain and the snow. I can drive pile in the rain and the snow. Uh, can't pave in the rain and the snow so easy. So, uh, you know, we should have access to on Norfolk Avenue till about the 4th of July, and then it will close to uh, the Pringers area and the Dollar General. Uh, the street will be closed uh, once they start. Um, so remember the folks that are on the east side, they're there and they will be open. So. Appreciate it, Dennis. And certainly I think the most important piece of it all is just to keep our citizens updated as a project goes forward. So we'll appreciate do. you being here. Matt's here as well from Olson's. Um, as well, I don't know if you had any questions for him. Yeah. Here at I was a little bitter today, so that's why I'm here tonight. <laughs> but part of the, um, I want to point out one other thing that Dennis says is we will have a pre-construction meeting, so we'll inform the public before that. We'll have a public pre-construction meeting, so that's part of our scope that you approved a couple council meetings ago. So we'll go ahead, have that public meeting, inform the schedule. That contractor will be at that meeting. Our observer is going to be there. I think that's one of the most important things on a project like that is communication, especially with these business owners as we move forward too. I would agree. Thank so. you. Have you worked with this company before? I have not. I did check some references from there. Um, they were they came very highly recommended. One thing I, I'll be honest with you, the one thing they didn't have a lot of experience with was bridge aesthetics from that standpoint. But as far as scheduling and bringing in crews, the multiple crews, they can get the job done. I felt comfortable after I checked the references. I don't know if we got anybody here from Dixon Construction. Right here. There you are, right. behind me. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> come, on for, come on forward, will you, David? No. Speak in, sign in. Appreciate seeing you here. Good to be here. Uh, my name is Dave Dixon. I'm with Dixon Construction. We've been doing bridge construction for since 1938. Um, we have a lot of experience with doing bridges like this in an urban environment uh, with associated street paving and whatnot. Um, we do have pretty good experience in the aesthetics. Um, as far as the prices coming in high, I thought the prices were pretty much in line with what they should have been for an urban project of this nature, and, and, and I guess I kind of think that we were probably very competitive with the Hawkins or the Keywoods or any of those people. I don't know why they didn't show up, but I think our bids were very competitive with for the nature of the project. But, uh, you know, we, we think that we can get the project done maybe even a couple months early from the completion date, so um, we've got good crews to to get after it, and I think we stand a very good chance of, of getting it done. Yeah, an early completion, yeah. Uh, and earlier than completion, maybe a couple months early even. Very good. Love Speak. to be able to hold that, hold you to that, but I know Mother Nature's got a lot to do with it. So. Yes, I will. We'll definitely give it our best. Speaking of the aesthetics, you, you pretty much see the importance of that with everything we're doing so yep. that will be a huge thing not I mean not just the construction that's important too but we are going to be really watching that so, so yep. do 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 good on that yeah. yeah I don't think that can be overstated because as yeah. Shane said before it's kind of a welcome to our downtown uh, from the, from the east side and an expansion of our downtown streetscape so will be a very very important component of the project yep yep and I'm, I'm very aware, aware of that so okay. We'll Thank you. We can. And I, I might say foundational to our trails project all, all over town. So it's a linchpin in what else is going to happen in the neighborhoods. So. Yep. 
Yep. And we've done the form liner that goes down underneath where the trail is going to go, and and we've got all good subcontractors. I'm very happy with all the subs of the team that we've got put together, as far as the coatings that go on the form liner and and whatnot. So I I think uh, we got a real good team to to get pull this project off successfully. Thank you. I have a little bit different question. Your your time frame is obviously hopefully 30 days uh, earlier than the than the completion date that we asked for and now you're saying possibly even 60 days um, what's your time frame of working like is, are you looking at 24 7 are you looking at 6 in the morning till 10 at night did you know approximately we're probably what? looking to work Monday through Friday 10 hour days but instead of having just one crew in here for a large part of this we're gonna have two crews in here we find that we can progress the project along faster by having two crews in here rather than working one crew 24-7. Uh, and really, in, in the bridge construction, it, it's pretty hard to work your, your people seven days a week. Um, they'll be on the road, but uh, uh, we like to get them home on the weekends uh, so that they can be with their families. And, and uh, you know, we in the bridge construction industry, we work year-round, so um, it, it, they kind of like to be home on the weekends. You know, the, the paving and grading industry, they. They shut down during the winter, and, and we typically don't. So. Okay. I think all the neighbors would appreciate not hearing piling in the middle of the night. So. <laughs> yeah. No, we won't be driving okay. piling at night. Well, welcome to Norfolk. All right. Glad to have you here. So, Good to be here. Thank, thank you. you. One of the other things we do at that pre-construction meeting is, is that we like to have, as Matt said, we want to have the, the observer that's going to be working for the city and the folks that are going to be the foreman on the bridge crew there so that those business owners and the people know who those faces are that if they've got an issue that's the guy they need to find on site if they've got something that's affecting them right there at that instant so we find that that was very helpful i think dennis did a really good job saying you know our estimate what we did underestimate and bottom line um I think we didn't take account of the restricted area like we should have. It is a unique project. You know, I've been in the business 20 years, I haven't done anything like this before. This is a very unique project. Um, unique project at Praline for Dennis himself. He's been here for 40 years, right? <laughs> First big bridge we've done. <laughs> yep. So I think it's a very unique project. And I bottom line, I think we just really underestimated from that standpoint, being the restricted environment, um, the liquidated damage it causes is in there. You know, those things just escalated the price a little bit. I think material cost too, you know, for concrete material cost is, Dennis said, I'm hearing that's creeping up also from that standpoint. We're in good hands, Matt. Yep. So appreciate, appreciate seeing you here tonight too. Any other questions for you? I think, I think it's important too that we also state, you know, one of the reasons we went this route with this particular type of design, you know, we had different options that may have been a little bit cheaper, like box culverts and whatnot. And those were kind of thrown off the table because of just the aesthetics of it, the looks of it. I mean, you're coming in in Norfolk, you know, we've had a tremendous amount of businesses downtown. They're reinvesting in downtown, and we felt that it was important to make this look nice when you come into our community. And, and um, with the trail going underneath the bridge, with it being nice and open, it's going to feel safe. Yes. With the box culvert, you don't always get that safe feeling because it is enclosed. And so I think some of that's very important, especially since we're, our estimates and stuff are so drastic, you know, it's, we're, we're, we're a little different than what we initially thought, but um, I also think it's important that, you know, we sit up here and we look at budgets all the time. We know where the money's come from, but not everybody in the community knows that. So, Dennis, if you could just real quick explain how those CHAFE funds works, works and um, where those funds come from. Uh, most of the funding for this project are coming from what we call CHAF funds or City Highway Allocation Funding. Uh, this is a portion of the gas tax that... Uh, we all pay at the pump that comes back to the communities from the state of Nebraska. That's a rather complex formula, but uh, we get money there. We also get some uh, federal money that uh, is funneled through the state that for roads and for bridges. Um, so that's basically what it is. It, in, in we use all but about $415,000 of the money we get from the state. Uh, two and a half to three million dollars each year for capital construction projects or large maintenance type projects. 
bridge construction, reconstruction of streets, uh, the uh, grinding and the inlays that you saw that you've seen on First Street and some of those things. Those are the types of projects that uh, we use these uh, capital construction dollars for. So. Um, what we'll have to do is just delay a couple, a uh, couple projects uh, from the planned 17 construction season to 18 construction season, uh, as we do our one and six year uh, street plan for the next uh, six years. We'll have to look at uh, reallocating uh, some of our our priorities uh, to make them fit in in, in that area. But uh, we most certainly will do that. Uh, we'll also need to look at some of our our cost estimates in light of the uh, the more recent trends that we're seeing in in road construction and it's just like everything else in this state we're short of people for all of our jobs we're short of concrete paving contractors and in folks that work in those industries so that tends to drive up your costs some so we're just gonna have to reflect those in our estimates and, and plan the best we can and and uh, hope for the best so Thanks, Dennis. Anything else? Helpful. All right. Thank you, Council. Thank I appreciate you very your support. Much. All right. All right. And with that, please vote. All council members voting in the affirmative. Motion carries. All right. Next is consideration of a approval of a consultant contract with G. G. J. Turkelson. And associates for an analysis of the city's land mobile radio system. I'll make a motion, Your Honor. Second. second. All right, we have a motion with a second, and we have Lyle to come forward and speak with us. Good evening, Mayor and Council. That agreement you see tonight on the agenda there is our, our next step in the tower construction process, communication construction process. Um, a brief history on it. There was uh, spring of 2015, summer 2000, early summer 2015, we found out a portion of our communication system, the EDAC system, e Enhanced Digital Access Communication System, is going to be going obsolete in the future sometime 2017 to 2020. Um, we have some divisions that rely on that system. Currently our tower, our uh, antennas are placed in the water tower, a water tower that doesn't hold much, actually any water, its primary purpose is for holding the antennas. It takes maintenance and upkeep, it's costly. We got the, considering the thought of you know, building our own tower, housing our own communication system learned rather quickly that this is a very complicated process. Starting in November, we met with a tower company. December, we met with another one. They both said, yeah, we can build your tower. Not too sure about your communication system. Might need to look somewhere else for that. So we looked at some couple communication consultants in February and April. Same type of deal. They said, we can do your com communication stuff. Um, and when I say that, I mean evaluating the bids that we would get, the, the best options that we could get for the communication system. But we're not too much into towers. <clears throat> so we can I continue to search. We continue to search for somebody that could help us go from uh, barren ground to tower to communication system. A lot of the tower construction costs are based on the type of equipment that's going to go on there. Surface area and, and wind load and altitude height all plays into the type of tower. Um, following that, we talked with a couple radio companies, Motorola. They came and put on a demonstration and they said, you know, we can, we can do everything. We talked to Harris, uh, excuse me, Motorola has Harris radios, our current provider, and they said, we can do everything. So it's a, it's a complicated process. This gentleman, um, Gary Torkelson from Minnesota, has served in the service, was in the law enforcement in various capacities over time. He is comfortable, it's the first, first entity I've talked to that is comfortable from taking it from bare ground to completed project. He does it in two or three phases. Right now he's working in Yankton. Their first phase is an evaluation of, they'll come and ask, see who the users are, how it's being used, 
since we've been with the current company that we have now, Raycom, for pushing 20 years, technology has, came, has come a long way, and there's a lot of options out there that we're not that familiar with because what we have been using has actually been serving our purpose pretty, fairly well, uh, really well, actually, and, and just because of the, the outdated equipment is another component to consider this. Anyway, Mr. Torkelson said he'll come and, and do this phase one project, look at the users, look at how we're using it, the potential for, for future uses, and give us a recommendation, hash it out a little bit, and then he'll give us a, a final recommendation about four months or so turnaround. From that point, and that's, that's phase one, and that's all that this agreement is for. From that point, we can consider if it's something that we can designate a company to go with, I, I mean a specific company, do it ourselves, go off a state system, or if we bid it out and he would help us um, in a second and po potentially a third, but most likely a second phase to come up with the, the bid documents, the RFPs, and most importantly, the evaluation of the submissions that we would get from those companies. With that, I would try and answer, I'd do my best to answer any questions you have. I think it's also important to, Lyle, good job, Lyle. Um, Lyle and the public works and public safety leads have been working on this, like Lyle described, for a long time. The complication of that is, I can speak firsthand to that, um, being here for as long as I have and seeing its uh, um, transition of, of our radio system and ability of technology now is it's complicated. I mean, the guys are trying hard to get their hands around this, and we're working with the state of Nebraska. The state of Nebraska was just here. Uh, the OIC, the officer in charge of communications uh, for the state of Nebraska, was just here uh, last week, and we're partnering with the state of Nebraska, too, to try to see if we can dovetail into the statewide system. But in order for us to really understand what we need for a uh, communication system, um, this Mr. Torkelson is going to help us through that, and it's going to be money well spent because it's a long-term investment. Obviously, it's for public works and public safety communications which has got to work. We're good, we're good at providing those services, but uh, all we rely on is the push to talk. And we want it to work, and we want that information and that data to be transmitted back and forth in between the cruisers and the fire trucks uh, seamlessly, and, and most importantly, in between the, the providers of that services seamlessly, uh, whether we're working on a water main in the middle of the night or fighting a fire or doing a, uh, anything that the police department would do, a robbery or what have you. So. Um, we appreciate uh, your support on that. This has been through a subcommittee, Lyle. Yep, September um, 7th well. at 8 a.m. And uh, again, we'd answer any questions that the council might have. Any questions? Go ahead. Lyle, do you foresee this happening? And then in the future, us being able to communicate better with the county and the state on top of that? Potentially. There's, there's that potential for all of that. There's, um, you know, there's, that's could be part of part of the state system. I'm not that familiar with it outside of what we heard on for two hours yesterday. But um, I would like to think there would be. Okay. I think you know really, and we absolutely would like to think, uh, Councilman, that that would be the case. You know, it's going to be a transition. State of Nebraska as a whole is transition and have been for a number of years. There used to be a, a task force that Chief Meister and I sat on. Oh, I don't know where Chief go, 15 years ago or more, probably 20 now, um, talking about the statewide radio system. Well, the statewide, the governor's very, the current governor's very interested in, in uh, making sure the statewide system is up and operational and, and working good for not only the state patrol, but MPPD and, and Department of Roads. And us to dovetail into that, uh, we, we know from our meeting with uh, uh, the director of communications at Lincoln and Omaha are close to dovetailing their systems in and are going through the same process that we are. So as you continue to link those major metropolitan areas with uh, cities of the first class, you know, you, you get this domino effect perhaps where you can really get some seamless communications with our local providers. As you guys completely understand, I mean, all emergencies occur locally. so. Um, what we rely on is 99% of the time we rely on the communication between our, our public works and public safety guys every single day. That has to work seamlessly, but it's nice when State Patrol and or Madison County or Department of Roads or even NPPD 
uh, could come in and dovetail into that communication so, system. So that's really what the goal is long term. We're a small, small, small piece of that. But as we're learning more and more about the statewide system um, through that uh, meeting last week, I think there's great opportunity for that to happen. We just got to make sure we cross our T's and dot our I's from the technology standpoint. And that's part of hiring this consultants to help us walk, the, walk through this because, again, uh, we're not, <coughs> we're pushed to talk folks for the most part. And we're not the technology guys that really make this come together and we need some outside support. Okay. Any other questions, Council, at all? For either Shane or Lyle? You know, I'll just say that that technology wheel spins pretty fast. It does. And it does. It's um, probably beyond our control and scope <coughs> to be able to, to was, understand all that as a, as a city staff. It was not incredible. The, not the staff doesn't do a great job, but that's a, that's a world in and, in and to itself, and I think this is probably money well spent. Yeah. When they, one of the demonstrations that came, they had it, now the, some of the radios have wireless uh, GPS locations in them, so they have the ability to, from my former job as an incident commander at the fire division, you could overlay radio positions on a map, which would be incredibly handy on, on big fires, grass fires. You could see where resources were, were where they needed to go, and the, the t technology has advanced so much in the last five years, not to mention the last 15, um, that <clears throat> it's hard to know what you're missing. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And with that, I would ask you then to vote for approval of the consulting contract that's provided you. All council members voting in the affirmative motion carries. Okay. And last but certainly not least, I'm looking at the 2016 snow and ice plan, and that would be you, Mr. Dooley. So if you will come forward. We're hoping for no snow and ice this season, but planning for it anyway. <laughs> this Second the motion. This year. <laughs> this, yeah. This year. Yeah. Okay. That would be nice. And next. <laughs> Lyle, did those little Girl Scouts all leave? Yeah. Did they? <laughs> would you? Well, Mayor and Council, in your package, you should have a copy of our 2016 uh, snow plan. Uh, I'll go through it here real quick with you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to rest assured that we are ready for uh, snow and ice. Our guys have been working hard at getting all of our equipment ready. Uh, we're all set up for de-icing, uh, which will probably be the first activity we'll get involved in. Uh, but uh, we are ready for... for uh, this winter. I uh, can give you an overview of how the plan works. Uh, we wait uh, to clear the streets until we have over two inches of snow. Uh, that's kind of our, our uh, mark of when we do a full operation. Now, uh, when we do a full operation, we're actually putting 22 pieces of equipment uh, into play. We got 13 plows. Uh, we have uh, four loaders, uh, we have two pickup plows, we have two maintainers. Uh, so if we actually decide to do a full-blown uh, plowing operation, it's pretty significant. So that's why uh, the two inches. Two inches, we let Mother Nature take its course, and then we help that out with uh, de-icing. Uh, Jim, let me ask you right there if I could. Yeah. Two inches, but it's calling for six, but you're still going to wait for the two inches, or is that a tr We're not taking any no. action until then the completion of the snow. Well, you know what the problem is, and we hear it all the time, is that those two inches get so matted, padded down when another four and six and eight lay on top of it that how do you respond to that? Exactly. Uh, those first two inches get matted down because it's still snowing usually. We usually don't send our plows out right, right. until we're through, uh, right. until it quits snowing. So then that's when we start. The other thing that we have, and a lot of people just, you know, we're dealing with gravity plows, and, and that's an understanding that, that a lot of folks just can't understand. Well, if gravity plows are giving you the problem, why don't you go with downforce plows? Uh, it seems, why don't log you? seems logical. Yeah. 
because then you could scrape all the way down to the surface. Well, they don't make downforce plows for big trucks. And the reason they don't is that you could imagine if you had a, a dump truck that had a downforce plow and you're going down the street and the street's uneven, something's got to give. The street, the plow, or the truck. Because, it, because there's that much, that much force. Now they do make downforce plows for smaller units. The other disadvantage of a downforce plow is once you use downforce, you no longer have control of your plow. And when we're doing city streets, we're weaving in and out of, out around cars, and we're, we're going around curbs, turning lanes. So it's all, you know, you wouldn't have that. Half the time you'd have to have that plow up just so you could turn. I appreciate yes? that. Yeah, okay. it does. Thank you. Jim, to kind of further follow that questioning, you know, anymore, I mean, you can, look on a, you can look on a cell phone and you can say 60 miles west of here, they've already got their two inches, now they've got four inches, and we're starting to get snow here, and it's fairly obvious to everybody that, yeah, we're going to get way more than two. So does it make sense to wait until we get that first two out of six that we know is coming? Or, or does it make more sense to, to start clearing it off as soon as it gets here? We could do that. This is the matter of, of, is the manpower, the manpower of doing that. The other thing that you run into is, is how many times are you going to cover up someone's driveway, somebody's sidewalk? Uh, that comes into play. Uh, and then uh, it's just the cost. It's just the cost. If we go out and we do it when it, at full operations when it's two inches and there's another four inches, Somebody's got to go back out there and clear the rest of that street. Now, if it takes us 12 to 14 hours to do those operations, when do we do it? Does it make sense to wait until we're not dealing with the traffic uh, and we go out there and, and do our plowing operations? And that's usually when it happens, is at 2 o'clock in the morning. And then usually the snow is done by then. Uh, we're not dealing with the traffic. And uh, it just makes for a better operation. Has that historically been our policy is to wait until all the snow's fallen to go out and see? In the past, have we gone out prior to the snow stopping? No, typically we wait till the snow stops. Now, the other thing that happens, especially, you know, like our last blizzard, people just want to, just dying for us to go out and plow. The problem that you have when you go out and plow in a blizzard is whiteout. You know, if you're, if you're in a plow and you hit a drift and you got wind behind it, we're in complete whiteout. So it's not safe for our drivers. It's not safe for the citizens. Uh, and the other thing that it does is what happens when you go out and plow is the public sees it. So now they're going to go out. They're going to start going out. And all of a sudden now we're starting to deal with, with folks getting... Uh, stuck in snow drifts because they think it's we're out there plowing they can get around so do, do it, we, it really is a double-edged sword yeah I can see that yeah it's tough do we typically exhaust our snow removal budget every year you know what <laughs> I was told and I hope this is true there is no s snow removal budget as far as maxing out. We, we probably better you know, you get gotta, some clarification you do. from our city administrator on that one. Yeah. Well, sure, we budget, I mean, we budget for snow removal and we've maxed it out or we've underspent it, we've overspent it. Yeah. Um, you know, the famous story that I've always been told from the 83, 84, it wasn't that, that winter was before my time, but uh, everything ends and begins in the budget except for snow. Um, because we had a major winter back in 84 and then we had record levels of snow back then and of course you run into the same problems that everybody wants to be mobile as soon as they can and it was better in the 80s and it is now it's even worse now uh, so the mayor and council um, expended funds well beyond the budget but got into their reserves basically to make sure that uh, we are clearing the streets and had the budget authority to do that. So yeah, we budget for it, you know, we estimate that and if the dear Lord's good to us, we underspend and if we overspend, we overspend it. Um, you know, as back to Jim's point about can we push the snow? Sure, we can push it 
24-7 in theory, other than we only got so many staff, and our staff have got to be safe, they got to be present, they got to be accountable for mentally and physically as they're running that heavy equipment up and down our streets, just to take care of the safety factor, again, for our citizens and for them. I mean, we have guys that come in, a vast majority, in fact, come in uh, when we're pre-planning a major snow operation like that, and the guys are, Jim and the staff are watching the forecast 24-7, all winter long, it seems. But uh, when we know a big snow's coming, we got guys that are coming and staying on cots and staying in the snow plow right there at, uh, right at the shop, um, just getting ready so they are sure they're here boots on the ground so they're not stuck at home um, in a middle of a blizzard and they can actually get here and perform their duties. And I, you know, I'm proud of them for, for that because you know, that's going above and beyond the call of duty because they could easily say, well, sorry, I can't make it in, it's a blizzard. You know, but um, yeah, they don't. They come in. Can't get in. <laughs> they come in. You know, yeah. the biggest thing in the snow operations and the snow plan, you know, if I had a magic wand, I think if we all had a magic wand, if people would just stay home until the snow's done, you know, it'd go so much further to have a clean operation for Jim and his staff, and the streets would look so much better. But the problem is, you know, we're a mobile society 24-7, and folks do not stay home a lot. I mean, unless it's a major, major blizzard. But even then, I mean, the police and fire guys would tell you stories about uh, pulling out folks that just are not using common sense, and they're out there risking it um, for the fact that they want to be risk takers. No, I get and then, So we run into that a lot. The public safety guys really run into that a lot. And, and then it kind of takes resources away. Well, it doesn't kind of. It takes resources away from our fire and our police operations because the emergency traffic uh, doesn't come to a halt. I mean, sometimes it slows down, sometimes it, it speeds up during those type of major snowstorms. Um, but those guys are spending resources pulling people out and trying to manage those kind of um, decision making, I guess, for lack so of So we, we do budget for that chain, but you know, off the top of your head, you can't, can't really tell me whether we've spent the entire- Maybe Last year, I, I don't know for sure if we spent overspent last year. Do you know what NSF? Well, you, there isn't a line in the budget that says snow removal. Where snow removal shows up is overtime in the street division primarily, in the fuel accounts, we burn through a lot of fuel, and in the equipment maintenance accounts. The, the more snow you have to push, the, the more issues you have with equipment. Um, the street folks, they work 14, 16 hour days whenever there's snow to be moved. And they do that every day, day in, day out, that there's snow to be removed. I don't know whether, I don't think we overspent the, the, um, the personnel account, but you know, 14, 16 hour day and put a couple of them back to back, you better be resting your folks or you're gonna be uh, burning them out and uh, they're not gonna be safe and nope. uh, we'll have those kinds of issues. So I understand it. So we're both, everybody's right. There is a snow budget, but uh, it's not the line item, but we budget for that. Unless Back to you, Jim. Go. All right. All right. <laughs> Good discussion, though. Good yeah, discussion. I appreciate it. Uh, ideally, you know, if we can start at 2 a.m., that's, that's our go-to time, and that's typically what our guys are gearing up for. Uh, what's great about that is we're not dealing with the traffic, uh, and we can go out there, we can get our emergency routes done, we can get our snow routes done. Uh, we get started with downtown, so that's our ideal time uh, to get those folks out. Uh, as far as the amount of, of uh, streets that we're taking care of, there's 144 miles of streets and about 20 miles of alleys. Now the alleys, we have the folks from the water department have a couple folks that they lend us and they operate uh, pickup truck plows to clear our alleys. As far as the city itself, uh, we have it divided up into uh, 10 sections. Uh, each one of those sections has one to two areas uh, in each section. And the reason that we did that is so that we can uh, spread out our resources. Uh, whenever we start plowing opera operations in our residential areas, uh, there's at least one plow in each one of these, these uh, sections. And the reason we divided it up into areas, we're going to look at area A here, is area A has two different, or section, section A has two different areas, one and two. And in our uh, snow operations 
sequential plowing operations, we're going to be in, in plowing operations number two this year. And if we look at section A, uh, we're going to go into area two first. And then the next snowfall that we have will be snow operations number three. And then uh, area one will be done first. And that continually rotates. So if you're looking at section B there, uh, we're going to go into to area four and 11 and then three. And then that keeps rotating as you look down, down the line. And that's just a fair and equitable way of, of doing operations. So there, they're showing the area and then we're going to go into two first. Uh, as far as our snow priorities, uh, we do our emergency snow routes first. Uh, you have a copy of those in your packet. Uh, we do the emergency snow route uh, first. When we do the emergency snow route, we divide our forces. Uh, there's six plows that go one way, seven plows that go the other. And in about two hours, they got the main uh, emergency snow route done. Then they come back, they regroup, and then they break up again and then they go into our snow routes. And our snow routes fall into more residential areas and primary business district areas. And they clean those out. There's, there's four of those if you've seen those in your pack. Uh, we don't need as, when we first start out, we're doing four lanes. So there's actually six plows following each other. And some of the public wonder why, why we're doing that. Uh, but the reason for that is we just go down that street one time and we go curb to curb. And that's just a fast and efficient way of, of doing that. Uh, as far as uh, our other priority is the downtown business district. Uh, the reason that's a priority is it's very time consuming. Uh, we need to remove the snow from the downtown business district. So uh, we send a couple maintainers down there. Uh, they windrow it and then it's picked up uh, with a snow blower and put into a contractor's uh, Porter Construction is usually our contractor for that, and they haul it off. As far as a snow emergency, uh, last year we declared a snow, snow emergency for our uh, blizzard, and that's usually declared by city officials. If guys are getting out there or we're getting a lot of snow and, and uh, it's hard to move the snow off the street, I'll touch base with Dennis and, and Shane and the mayor, and we'll, we'll talk. And, and decide whether we want to declare a, a snow emergency. Uh, that'd be a situation where it'd be necessary for public safety, uh, make snow removal more timely and cost efficient. And basically that's when we uh, only allow parking on the even side of the streets. And there's no parking on our emergency routes. So get even, Steven. <laughs> Diane makes me say that. Let's go I'm even, Steven. You don't need one other comment I would make about moving snow during blizzards earlier in the thing is, is as you go push that snow out, you create a windrow out at the outside. And if that wind's continuing to blow, it just now instead of putting snow a foot deep on the, on the street, it now puts it two feet deep. And you're back moving that, those, that snow more and more. So. main emergency snow route and the other snow routes you have in your packet. And those would be the main streets, uh, Benjamin Avenue, Alm, Koningstein, Norfolk Ave, Omaha, Paswalk, Prospect, 1st, 4th, 7th, and 13th. I'm going faster because I know you've got another meeting coming up. So The emergency routes are, and you mentioned it, are they before or after the downtown? Different groups, same time. Okay. So what happens, uh, when, well, that's a good question, Jim, because uh, what we do is the snow so it can pick up with the, the blower. The only reason I asked it is because that's one of the things that came up 
last year he says well they're concentrating on downtown and not even catching the emergencies and i said no no they, it's a different equipment and i exactly, wanted that exactly. stated that way yep good point as far as uh if we do declare a snow emergency uh dispatch and city crews are notified uh, we try to notify the public in many ways uh, we do emergency text alert to send out on twitter facebook uh, cable tv we get a hold of the newspaper, radio, and also any of the electronic signs in the city, uh, we put notification that we're in a snow emergency. Once that happens, uh, we activate our snow number, which anyone had any questions about uh, where we're at as far as a snow emergency, they can call that number for additional information. Uh, as far as de-icing operations, <coughs> last year was a record year. Uh, we used over 800 tons of salt uh, on our streets just because of the, the nature of the, of the weather last year. Uh, we'd get freeze-thaw, so we ended up using a lot of, of salt. Uh, with that, we worked closely with the police division. Uh, they're 24-7, and, and if things start getting icy, uh, they'll let us know. Uh, our first priority, of course, there again would be the emergency routes. And bridges first. Uh, this next year, our no salt streets will be 13th and Paswalk Avenue, uh, first in Madison Avenue, and the westbound lane of Madison Avenue from 1st to 7th Street. Uh, if our citizens want to get a hold of, uh, look at our uh, snow plan. Or want to see that map of where they're at as far as a residential area and when they're next on the rotation uh, they can look that up at ci.norfork.ne.us backslash street and look up snow plan and they'll have the same information that you have so i was going to note that that was kind of interesting there's more phone numbers in there for ones that i've struggled to come up with including um some people's that you don't have their cell number, but they're all in there. So <laughs> public, if you want to give them a call, they're there. So. Yep. Any questions? I have one. Um, uh, yes. As far as when you do the 13 plows, are they all out at once? They all go out at once, and then after a 16-hour period, then they all come back in, and every t we're, we're well, off well, for a while, or do you try to keep? No, those plows are all out at once. Okay. Uh, so those 13 plows, what they do is that initially they break up, and they do that uh, emergency route. They'll come back, that takes about two hours, they come back, they regroup, then they do the snow routes, which involves, if you've seen that in How your long maps. How that regroup uh, phase? Long enough to go to the bathroom and a cup of coffee and back out in the truck. Sure. Uh, they, they're so dedicated to making that happen. I've, I really never ever see them take a break. They're not taking, uh, you know, maybe five minutes and, and they're back out in the street. Because the longer they stretch it out, they know that they're, it's gotta get done, so. I think the thing, like we were at one time lapse where we had a discussion, me and you had a discussion even, um, it's when that we're down and that's when people start starting to go, why aren't they plows all right? You know, they just ran a 16 hour shift. Is there any possible way of, you know, do you run two shifts or I don't know. I don't know what's best. I think it's, I mean, I, I think it's kind of a catch 22. I mean, could you run two shifts and cut your plows in half? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, or could you hire? more contractors would be i guess another way to solve that if you hired but there's some i say that with some caution because one thing about our staff is they know the streets they know the equipment they know the process they know everything about the snow operations you know they're going to be better than any contractor we hire on that particular nothing against our co local contractors but on clearing streets that's their business they do it quite well um, if to split the shifts up and, and have kind of a rotator where you have six or seven plows out at a crack and then rotate the other seven, you're really, it's a catch-22. Yeah, you'd see the show of force, I guess, for lack of better words, of the plows always out there in some sort, some portions of our community, but the guys are hitting it one big shot and uh, trying to get it accomplished, so it's probably a catch-22. Well, it only really happened that one storm we had. You know, we didn't get all the streets cleared because it was just, it was that when we had this, we had, we had, little, we had layers, it, it rained, it yeah. snowed, and then it got, you couldn't even go out and move it, it just spun yeah, like heads. this. It was yeah. like, it was the weirdest snow I've ever, even, like I moved snow too, and it was hard to, 
even get our equipment going. You just spun on it. But that was kind of when that was <coughs> happening, and I didn't know in those situations if we're ever, if there were ever anybody who was trained, you know, besides just the street department, to maybe hop in those when they're down. We are working on not. Uh, one of the things we are working on is is uh, we're bringing in an additional uh, gentleman from the parts division. We're training him okay. uh, in snow operations. We just trained uh, ten of the firefighters oh, okay. so that they could use loaders, you know, so that they could man them at each each fire station. So we're making those those kind of moves, but uh, it, it takes time. Sure. Good thing. Uh, yep. And it's it's hard. Yeah, you. <coughs> When you got a system, you almost need to work the system. Yeah. You know, I mean, you got a system where you start out at two o'clock, it works great. You know, I deal. You know, if we tried to run those plows where it was visible to people, and we're out in that traffic and dealing with that, and you've plowed, so you know, yeah. you know what what you're dealing with. Uh, it's just better to get them out there, get the job done in the early morning, and and uh, get the job done. Mm. You know, so a lot of times. Uh, it's not visible. All the work that they're doing is not necessarily seen. I think you'd be more than happy to have any of the elected officials right at 2 a.m. in the morning. I took that experience myself with Lloyd one time. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I would, you would enjoy it. I would it. tell you, though, take overshoes, lots of gloves. It was cold in there. It was windy. <laughs> but it was an experience I'll never forget. And certainly you'll learn to appreciate what it is you can Yeah, and we'd welcome any of the elected officials to yeah. do that. 2 a.m. in the morning. Or even later on where we, do, where we get into residentials. That's even more interesting. Take me up and drop me off at work, maybe. <laughs> You'd enjoy it. Before. Question, and it's, I know you can't answer it here now, and it, will, it would take some historical checking, but we know that we've got 144 miles of streets, plus or minus. That's growing, has grown over the last 10 years. We've got 22 pieces of equipment. Has that grown or has that stayed the same over the last 20 years or 10 years? Or, you know, those are all kinds of things that at some point in time you hit where you have to add equipment that you, you can't just keep adding miles all the time because if, if we could, the, the um, you know, so that, that's a long range situation thing that we, we probably need to look at if, if we're maximizing, you know, sure. if, if, we, if we grow 20%. I think it's unfair to to believe that that the equipment uh, allotment shouldn't at least grow to a certain percentage. Yeah, so. makes sense. Yeah. Probably where we have gained the folks out on the street is we picked up the couple from the from the utilities that are doing the alleys. Uh, we've gotten heavier equipment over time and had less snow, so we've pulled folks that uh, used to. When I started, we used to have two or three guys in the shop, and they were working full time just trying to keep the, the equipment working. You know, we've gotten some heavier equipment in it, so heavier equipment helps with uh, being more efficient at the moving. So I think we've probably increased our efficiency from heavier equipment, some four-wheel drive equipment, a couple guys from the utilities. We're going to pull one in from the park this year and being able to have folks uh, not need to spend the time in the shop. So we've probably got more equipment on the street than what we had 20 years ago? Have we had an increased staff? Don't think so. Have we increased the, uh, we've, we haven't, we don't have any more dump trucks, but we've, we've put some blades on loaders and some of those things that have made those more efficient. So I think we've made equipment efficiencies to make up some of those uh, things. And most certainly we need to look at it. We're pulling a guy in from the park this year that will help with, uh, with another man in the rotation, so to speak, so. Jim, I was glad you mentioned the text alert number. For the last several years, I've gotten calls from either a, a grandparent or a parent that said, hey, my, my, my grandson or my granddaughter, my kids. Yeah, they all get it. Boy, they got a ticket. <laughs> you know, what the heck's up with that? Well, every, you know, everybody's got a, got a phone, so. Yeah. Sign up for those, and it, what's it cost to sign up for that? Nothing. What's it cost for a ticket? <laughs> Plenty. <laughs> sign up. <laughs> Jim, where, where do you go to sign up for the text alerts? Website. Go on the website. Is it right on the, on the front? Uh, I do not know. Okay. That's something I'd have to ask. ask, ask Diane, Diane will have an article coming out here, and most certainly we'll make sure that that information is uh, included in there. 
for me. Okay. All right. Anything else? You bet. Well done, Jim. Thanks, Thanks. for what you do, because I know you don't look forward to the winter season, probably, do you? <laughs> no. It's, I'm getting a little better at it. <laughs> You're doing good. We're learning. All right. With all that being said, I see nothing further on the agenda. We are adjourned.